about um, my experience as a Node.js developer. Um, so I'll just tell you the title of the talk. Uh, it's the musings of a frustrated developer. And uh, this comes from the uh, pure vexing nature of Node.js uh, or JavaScript, I would say, as the more uh, perceptive of you may have uh, assumed. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm Shreyansh, uh, lovely to meet you. Um, and I write code, obviously, that's why I'm here. And um, those are some of my handles. Uh, please don't judge me for the last two. Um, I was young. And uh, I am really hor horrible at just making presentations. So why am I giving this uh, talk? Why am I having a chat with you about uh, some of the things I've learned? Uh, because it's actually important to see uh, some of the more uh, easy to make mistakes while we are uh, learning to be a developer. And I think so, um, ma'am here asked, you know, the, the entire uh, crowd who's presenting, what is, a, what is the good method of sort of getting into the development scene? Um, so you can imagine this to be sort of something along those lines where I'm giving you advice or where I'm telling you what I have experienced so you don't have to do that yourself. Um, with that said, uh, the other reason, and as many of the engineers uh, will agree with me, is that because no one uh, can write bug-free code, uh, I disagree with that statement, and for a very simple reason, uh, because there is a way. And um, I'll just show you that way. It's uh, you run this lovely command, um, and then you burn the computer, uh, and then you can live as a monk, which works out lovely, uh, which works out very nicely uh, if you're working with JavaScript. So. With all of that aside, let's actually go into the presentation. Uh, tour is to human and tour and prod is JS. Um, now, I'll just tell you a couple of the things which we'll be sort of covering in this, in this presentation. Um, in college, we learn how memory works, right? Uh, sadly, sometimes you forget how that happens in JavaScript because, well, it is JavaScript and nothing is what it seems like. Uh, and how we are using JSON for literally everything. Um, then I actually I work with cryptography, and sometimes I don't really know why I have messed something up in my code. Where I log a lot, uh, because as you can imagine, that I talk a lot, so of course that translates to logging uh, while I'm writing code. And uh, how configuration is just my new uh, sort of pet peeve, I would say. And express for the win, of course. So um, just a quick note here. Uh, I love Friends. How many of you watch Friends? Excellent crowd. So this is the first present, uh, the first sort of episode, I would say, uh, the one where I forgot how memory works. And uh, just to lay down on the application we are working with, something to give you a little bit of a context. So this application um, gets PDF files and sort of analyzes them of how good they are. Now, when I say good, I mean how useful they are for the end users. Uh, it's written in Express, by the way. At, at lovely uh, 2.57 AM, I get a nice notification from AWS saying that something is an alarm. And uh, well, well, it restarted. Great. Um, no biggie. We had around you know more than 15 nodes to sort of cluster for all the traffic which we had. But what we noticed after I think it's around half an hour was that every 20 minutes I was getting a notification, and um, I don't know why I was getting it, but uh, it was of a failing node, which would then restart, and the same thing will continue to happen ad infinitum. So the first thought. Right, you know, as a, uh, as a responsible sort of engineer, uh, the first thought should be that you know, after solid contemplation, you decide that okay, I'm going to just go into the prod, uh, the prod environment, and I'm going to debug it. Um, I was watching Rick and Morty, so pardon me for the interruption there. Uh, but finally, I, I got around to doing it, and uh, there's this very simple command. If anyone can tell me what this does. Yes, so this is an SSH tunnel, uh, which means that I'm connecting to, uh, huh? Let's not, uh, right, so I can basically access the port on the right, uh, which is on the system, which I'm trying to access the port on the left, very simply, uh, very simply put. And, um, you know, as, as uh, the first thing I'll do is just get into the uh, logging of whatever is happening in my application. And uh, you know, there's this lovely garbage collector in Node.js. 
and this is the thing i see that you know it's 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 working properly but uh, in two ticks which is i would say a couple of milliseconds or nanoseconds depending on uh, how many for loops you have in your application uh, or the complexity uh, it was just skyrocketing for absolutely no reason so the first question how and who can debug this the problem is that our code base has uh, quite a bit of code um around 2 lakh lines of code at this stage i have no idea okay so 90% of that is node modules i'm sorry um so a couple of methods do exist to sort of uh, debug this uh, the first one is core dump um just take a dump of whatever virtual machine or application is running on and analyze it from there uh security researchers love it i'm pretty sure uh the second one is something called mdb now this is not a very viable option for a very simple reason uh because this is a tool which is created by joint which is sort of like you can imagine it to be like a parent company for nodejs and it only runs on one of their proprietary operating systems uh so sad life there and there is no debug uh, i'm not even going to go into why that is horrible there is perfmon um which is not that great but it works on linux events uh you can get some sort of information from it but for production it's really really slow so you know i was having a chat with an engineer like you know a senior engineer and uh, the first thing i hear is are you lazy because uh, back in their day apparently they used to read ram with chips um which sadly i can't do because i have a very high level uh, system in my in my in my house i'm just kidding i don't so what did i finally choose uh, i'm sorry for waffling there but uh, i went with flame graphs and uh, these look really pretty like a lovely diwali light there um and just to give you a quick idea of what it is can anyone tell me what the y axis represents if anyone has worked on this exactly so that's a stack frame excellent can anyone tell me what the x axis means absolutely nothing uh because it's node uh so with that said uh, another thing the width of the box you see is the time it was uh, the time the amount of time for which it was on the cpu um and uh, just one thing so that that black box there that means that that is the process which is running when i took this uh, flame graph yeah so you know there's a simple controller call here uh, which which is calling two functions you know very simple sort of standard design practice and that looks like this um i'm just sent getting a post request there are some middlewares which i am you know authentication authorization all of that jazz and then i'm sending it for analysis which is this lovely function um there are some problems with it can someone tell me uh, what they are anyone from the crowd okay uh okay i'm sorry so uh the 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 first object there uh, parts that's basically a memory leak uh because i have a long term object in a short term context and the second one is the classic uh, post and pre increment operators which we learn in grade 9 uh, while doing computer science so javascript has this tendency of giving you something called an undefined at uh, where something is out of range instead of giving an index out of range exception um like the people who use java or any other programming language for that matter so very simply it is just uh, plus plus i from 0 to 11 i'm going pre increment undefined and there's a memory leak now we didn't really have good uh, debugging practices and monitoring practices right and uh, i was having a chat with some of my friends here and there was a very valid point which was brought up that you can do all the logging in the world but who monitors it who sees it um because you need some humanize right that's like saying that i have a, a entire system of cctv cameras but anyone can infiltrate if no one is looking uh, if someone has played counter strike they'll relate uh so how do we monitor it uh and the first question is how do we create those pretty looking diwali lights i call flame graphs um uh, we can create a heap dump which is uh, all of the objects in the memory and then i can just throw it in dev tools and see it from there very simple process you cannot create it in production though because it requires twice the amount of memory your system is currently running on so we had to think with with this in mind and how did we do that so node has a lovely uh, event uh, event uh, attachment uh, function called process.on 
where you can attach to native uh, Linux or Nix based uh, signals. The first one is SIG user 2. There is also SIG user 1, which are by definition not used by any processes. And then you can just get the heap dump package and you can give this command. Now, if anyone has worked in DevOps or has managed a server, writing kill in prod sounds like no. I'm not going to do that because I like what I'm doing at this company. Uh, let's just go to the man page for this and it says the kill utility sends a signal to the process. Um, the first thing is just terminate or signal a process. So we are signaling a process, not killing it. Please, please add the dot dash s. And um, another thing which you should keep in mind is just restart the process before it locks you out because at one of my companies where we had a, a memory leak, uh, we were logged out of our production clusters because we weren't able to SSH. Um, the SSH daemon wasn't able to, didn't have enough memory to basically decrypt our, our uh, credentials properly. And for those of you who don't really like using separate packages, as I think so happens at large companies, um, there are these two lovely sort of um, properties on process.memory usage, which is a function native in Node. Um, I don't remember the compatibility, but I think so it is 5.4 above. Um, the RSS or the resident set size is the total memory used by all packages. And uh, who can tell me what the heap is? Anyone? Anyone would like to take a short, like a quick sort of uh, one line description of what the heap is? That's the stack. That's different. So the heap is uh, the total memory for all the objects. Uh, the, the one thing which I would like to you to know is that heap versus stack, the argument which we have in any other programming language is not the same in JavaScript. Uh, for one reason, because it is JavaScript. Um, so before we move on, a uh, couple of things here which we should keep in mind while developing applications. Uh, proper memory debugging practices and proper monitoring practices so you know where your code is not functioning like it is supposed to. Um, the second one is, uh, I would say, uh, a lovely juxtaposition for who I am as a person, uh, a very talkative gentleman. And uh, I love to log. Uh, whenever I'm starting an application, I just love to write a lot of logs for everything I do. And this gives a lot of response latency, as you'll see in just a bit. So. I have a very simple route here, um, which just does a status for 200 and sends some JSON response. Um, for any normal engineer, this would be like around three lines of, uh, of, of logs. But for someone like me, uh, it is this. Um, most of it, it is just for fun. I'm not, I'm not sure why I, I do it. Uh, the second thing which I want to talk about is who has used Winston here? You've used Winston. Uh, OK, so how do you like it? Good, bad, horrible, very bad. All right. Um, so what Winston does is, uh, for those of you who have not used it before, uh, you send it logs and it's going to automatically upload it to your servers, whatever logging server or platform you have configured, which is great. Uh, but not for the application. Why? Because you're opening a new socket. And as we know, Node.js is a, uh, you know, as they say, uh, a single-threaded, uh, event-based, uh, driven I.O. system. So it means that if you open a new socket, you're basically compromising your business logic or the amount of memory or space your application has to run on. So the average latency was around 400 milliseconds for something as simple as that, which is literally just stringifying a JSON object. Um, out of which 328 milliseconds went for uh, just sending it to the production server. Um, so yeah, this is this is bad. This is bad. Now, to, in order to refine this process, we need to think about what is the point of logging. The point of logging for a developer at least, or an engineer is, you get the data, you have the payload, you have the stack, so you can replay everything like it was happening when the application crashed or out on you. Now, why um, Winston was an overkill for us is because your business logic is not responsible for sending logs to your production server. Simply, uh, the amount of complexity involved is just not worth it. Um, and just to summarize all of what I said in the last four minutes is uh, that Winston was really slow. Um, as I said, you know, it is it is uh, processing these logs through a transport. It is sending the uh, it through the transport where it is stored in a database or whatever have you. 
and uh, you know application should be responsible for sending them not processing them so the better method is write it to std out uh, a lovely console.log uh, and then pipe it to another process which is again very simple and you can achieve nirvana i'm just kidding don't try that um, with that in mind the second thing which you should keep in mind is control verbosity so when i say verbosity don't keep on waffling like I do for some reason. Uh, just see the amount of uh, logging you need in a separate environment. For example, in testing, you might want everything which is happening in the application. In, in uh, staging, you would only want the errors, probably, uh, because you don't really care about the warnings. I mean, who does? And in production, again, uh, probably the errors or the fatal exits, something along those lines. So control it. Now. How do you control verbosity in production in real time? So if I see that you know my 500 errors are spiking through the roof, how do I change the verbosity so that I can get everything I need to replay the, the, uh, the thing which is happening? And this is the question you have, that how will you interface this? How will you make it, uh, how will you bake this into the application such that you can change it right on the go? For that, we use management routes. Um, which are basically, for example, imagine there are two routes, uh, post management log and management health. Uh, what I do, I send a simple post request, and I just send the parameter there uh, with which I want to change it. Like, for example, I want to go from info to trace, or from trace to info, so on and so forth. And in the health, I can get how my external services are working. For example, how is my Postgres database doing? Or how is that lovely uh, Redis cluster going? Um, but this doesn't scale, because imagine if you have like a clustered environment with around 40 nodes, how will you go about doing this on every single machine? Um, and the first thing which comes to mind is, how can I automate this? Because, you know, a good engineer automates anything which takes more than 10 seconds with a shell script. Um, so for that, I will be introducing console. Uh, how many of you have heard of, at least, something called a service mesh or a service framework? Okay, all right, so excellent. So for those of you who do not know what a service mesh is, um, imagine it to be like a net which interlinks all of uh, every service which is going on, uh, which, is, which is similar or isomorphic in if I had to be a really professional at a conference. Um, so what Council will do is that it is going to give you something called reactive configurations. Now imagine I have a, a backend server and I want to deploy 10 bits or 10 instances of that server, and w I want my front end to use just one DNS. Because, you know, things can go down. Uh, you want, you want uh, like a DNS name based approach, because that is a lot simpler as opposed to going every node by name. Um, the second thing it gives you is, as I said, reactive configuration. Um, so, reactive means that I'll react to something. If someone slaps me, I'm going to react. Uh, if someone cracks a joke, I'll probably won't. Um, so, that means that whenever the configuration file changes, I will update my application. I am going to reload the configuration file and start from there, uh, which is very simple. Again, uh, we'll be using the process.onNirvana moment um, for single signal hand up, hang up, sorry. And imagine you have a configuration store like Redux or something. Just reload the configuration there. And there's a very simple code piece I wrote. Of course, don't use this in prod, because this is going to give you memory leak, but you get the idea here. Now, the benefits, of course, are uh, multifaceted. You can control whatever you need, whenever you need. You're not uh, wasting a lot of bandwidth on logging. And um, whoever is monitoring for you is probably having you know, a peace of mind, because you don't have to look through thousands of lines of logs for a simple request. Now, the episode three is probably the last one here, which deals with data security and cryptography. Um, now. I was uh, I was employed for a project which was written in PHP. Can I get a cheers for PHP here, please? As I thought. Um, so it had insecure authentication code. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean this. And uh, probably Valakar is going to kill me for showing this to everyone. Um, there's an MD5 happening in a production environment. Uh, this is cake PHP for the PHP fans here. Uh, lovely framework. And uh, the bigger problem which I, as, as someone who likes to sort of tell people about things, is that most, could, like, you're learning Node, you're learning JavaScript, you, you, you Google something, you go online, and um, you see that, okay, this is the way how you can store passwords, how you can update passwords, how you can create a very simple forgot password flow. 
they don't cover it properly because that's a huge worry. Think about it. If I can get access to a token which changes your password, it is as good as changing, as good as having your password. Think about it, because then I can change it to whatever I want instead of probably brute forcing on my GPU. So the usual flow is uh, you get a request, you send a request, send an email, click on the link, and magic. The first problem here, as I think so uh, many of us have talked about, is predictable tokens. Don't have something which is sequential, one, two, three, four, five, the next token, one, two, three, four, five, six is not good, please. Um, they can figure out how they work and they can keep on replaying it for random users. The second one is non-volatile tokens, um, which do not expire after use. I have seen this in production applications where I can literally use the same token again and again and again. Uh, so I can forge a request, basically. So there's a better way. Generate a random string. And uh, H, how many of you know what HMAC is? So you can imagine it to be like a hash with a password, which I can, uh, which I can change with the password. Uh, just use a random string, and for the key, use the current password, which you've stored in the database. What's going to happen is that you won't have to delete it, because upon a successful reset, uh, the password in the database changes, which makes the token by default uh, not valid. Now, why did I bring this up? Um, I'm sure most of you can't see what is happening, but the first request URL is HTTP. And what I'm going to show you next is going to blow your mind. Um, that uh, we are transmitting live credentials over a simple HTTP connection. Great. Why? Why? And then it is also sending me a cookie, which I can store in my system. Uh, let's take a look at that cookie. You can't, again, see it probably. Um, the user data option looks very interesting here. So I tried to decode it, uh, failed, um, and this is what it, it stores. The username and the password, clear as day, so a man in the middle attack is very easy. And my first response to seeing this was this, um, right? So just to recap, uh, whatever tutorials you follow online are probably not designed for production, so you would want to read about the package of the library you're using uh, while building a system. And uh, with that said, uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to me blabber for half an hour on a topic. Any questions from anyone? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I've tried to be corrupt. What did I suggest for encrypting pass? No, so that was HMAC, that was for resetting passwords. Uh, Bcrypt is, again, so uh, that's actually a very nice point there. Uh, m how many of you know what Bcrypt is? How does it work? Can anyone tell me very quickly? Uh, more or less. Uh, yeah, so what it does is that in, in security, there is something called a timing attack. Uh, which means that I can see the amount of time or the amount of processor resource some process is taking and then I can decrypt it. Uh, what bcrypt does is that it gives you um, sort of like a way to define the amount of time it takes for the hash to sort of uh, be generated for you. You can control that with something called a cost factor or a costing function. Uh, read about it, it's actually very interesting for those of you who want to use something like bcrypt. Uh, you should also look into argon2, which won the password hashing competition, I think, so last to last year. Anything else? Uh, anybody else uh, with who has the questions? Anyone in the audience? Uh, yep. Uh, thanks, right. uh, Shreyans. Uh, so with that.